I was convinced early on that we were dealing with a serial killer. And if we really know the truth, I believe he's probably killed more people in Oregon than probably anybody else. For a predator to be in, in, in a pen with all of the, 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 the victims, who knows how many victims he's got? He had opportunity. When that opportunity presented itself, he took advantage of it. I don't know why. I mean, why, why? I guess he didn't need a reason. What are the odds of being a prime suspect in all these murders? Uh, it wasn't until later his first victim that, that I even found out about, about this woman and that she was still alive and saying, oh man, she's lucky to be alive. He's always been a, a demon in my life, lurking in the back of my head. And I found these words that express it very perfectly. It's called my darkness within. Some of my demons left me. Some are just asleep. A few always travel with me. Others haunt me from the deep. He was one of those. The little ones are charming. They are allowed to stay. The big ones tear me up inside. I just wish they'd go away. I'm sorry. I know this road, like the back of my hair. Same with the stations, only half and back. Farms and truck stops, fireworks stands. I know this road like the back of my hand. Beginning in the late 1970s, a sinister presence cast a shadow over an isolated part of central Oregon. It lurked in the background, ignored or unnoticed. Women, often vulnerable or marginalized, were disappearing. It wasn't until decades later that a reckoning finally came. My name is Noelle Crombie, and I'm a staff writer for The Oregonian. Over the past two years, I've investigated these crimes and the man who is suspected of committing them. I've read thousands of pages of police reports, traveled halfway across the country, interviewed dozens of witnesses, and spent countless hours driving the road along which the killings took place. This is a complicated story that jumps around in time. So throughout this video series, you'll hear from people who were present at the events they describe, as well as those who investigated them, in some instances, much later. You'll hear tapes of police interviews that were conducted years after some of the events they address, You'll learn information that has never before been made public. These are the stories of the ghosts of Highway 20. I always thought that that's why these people get paid to protect you. They care, that's what I thought. They care about you. All this system was put in place to protect people, not judge them by who you're married to, what color your skin is. They made me feel like a smelly, drunken native, so I just shrank. It's just another something that I went in my little life, in my young days. I let my guard down and I was so angry, so angry. If they would only had listened to me. And you know, I feel guilty sometimes. If they would have just listened to me. It, it could have all been avoided. All of it. Marlene was a vulnerable young woman whose assault by a stranger should have provoked outrage and a demand for justice. Instead, her account was disbelieved, deepening her sense of trauma. The implications of law enforcement's failure to believe Marlene and aggressively pursue Ackroyd would be felt along Highway 20 for decades. 
she was his first known victim. Maybe, if police had listened to her, she would have been his last. The deputy stopped in and uh, told me that she had brought, went down and brought charges of rape against me, which was a shock, you know. Mm-hmm. And they said they're investigating it. And I talked with the deputy a couple times, and uh, he said, don't worry about it. He said, this probably will not come to court. All charges was dropped. They were supposed to put this man somewhere where he could not hurt anyone else. Look what happens. Look what happens. I hear I'm the only freaking survivor. One of the things he talked about was possibly maybe a log or something might have been placed over top of her body. And to me, that was really weird. I mean, when you think of a loved one disappearing, these are not the kind of scenarios you come up with, unless you've been there, done that. They did quite a bit more searching different areas where he had said he'd driven of course, it was all dependent on, you know, relying on what he had told him. He probably didn't tell him where he really went. They just never found her. No trace of Richanda was ever found. Unanswered questions about what really happened, who is to blame, and how things might have turned out differently trouble those affected to this day. You know, and that's probably what's haunted me my whole entire life, is looking back going, what didn't I, what did I fail to mention? I remember, you know, conversation with me and my mom yelling at her and stuff. I'm like, the only thing that I could have done to save my sister's life is if I would have stepped out and been like, good, I'm going to a, I'll be willing to go to a foster home just to get us out of the abusive environment. And of course, my mom was like, there was no abuse. <laughs> okay. You know, that's the, that was the only, looking back now, if I would have done that, it probably would have saved her life. Do you think he killed her? I don't know. I mean, I really don't want to think that way, but then there's the other part of me that wants to think that way. Looking back, I think, how in the world was he capable of doing it? Not really seeing signs. I think a lot of that. This guy was a sick individual. Um, he was a master manipulator, you know. I think for anybody that's looking for answers that wants to put blame on somebody, yeah, there's a little bit that I do put on my mom, but to say that it's all her fault, no. No, it's John Aykroyd's fault that this happened. You know, she could just bebop around and just be happy and, you know, until he took it away from her. Until he took it all away from her. What an evil man. We could have grew up together, you know. You know, she, she'd be a mother right now. Excuse me. I get to hear this. She doesn't. It just makes me so angry. That young lady, 13 years old, I'm sure she would have done something really awesome. My granddaughter, who's 13, she has her whole future planned out. Can you imagine that? Makes me wonder about that young lady that lost her life. (laughs) They should have listened to me. Despite its best efforts, the task force's attempts to extract information from Ackroyd were going nowhere. His knack for creating reasonable doubt, even while implicating himself, was taking them in circles. They knew that ultimately, it would be nearly impossible to prosecute him if they couldn't find Rachanda's body. They also knew that in the vast wilderness surrounding Santam Junction, that might never happen. He probably learned a lot from the K. Jean Turner case. He probably learned a lot about not disclosing where no, a body is. We knew all along what we were dealing with. This wasn't a, maybe this is our guy. We knew that he was the guy. It was very clear from the beginning. 
But at the time, it wasn't popular to prosecute without a body. So they shifted the attention to the Kay Turner case. And it looked like that was our best prospect to get him off the street before he killed somebody else. And that was our primary goal, was to keep from having more victims, which I feel we failed. Because those two young girls out of Newport, I believe, I'm quite convinced, died at his hands. You know, you, you do what you can. But it was a very important, maybe one of the most important things I've ever done in my life, is helping get him off the streets. You just don't know how many lives might have been saved. It saved women's lives. If he'd stayed out, if he had never been convicted, he and maybe Beck would have done more crimes and killed more women, for sure. You know, he managed to get through that whole thing without ever getting caught. That was the only time he's ever been arrested or charged with anything in his life. Not because he was all that smart, but he managed to do it. How did Aykroyd manage to do it? He was an opportunistic killer who preyed on women who were vulnerable and exposed. A runner on an empty road, a child who feared him, two teens adrift in the world. There were no witnesses and no physical evidence, but there had been an unmistakable warning sign. Before he was ever suspected of being a killer, Aykroyd had raped Marlene Gabrielson in the woods outside of Sisters. She went to police and they dismissed her as a liar. Aykroyd knew he'd gotten away with rape. He even laughed about it. He used the cover of Highway 20 to stalk women who were alone and counted on society's blind eye to marginalize people to avoid prosecution for decades. Killing the right kind of people in the right kind of place during the right kind of time was all it really took. Marlene Gabrielson grew up as a member of the Inupiaq people in Alaska, and she moved back there for a time after her rape, no longer feeling safe in Oregon. She eventually returned, but still struggles not just with the aftermath of the attack, but the knowledge that had she been believed, much of what followed might never have happened. I figured it was because I was nothing. I wasn't going to amount to anything. I was brown, and I was ugly. So, you know, you're not gonna amount to anything. Don't think you are, you know? I think that's why I cowered so much back then. And you haven't talked about it with people in those intervening years. You're the first person. And you know what my first thought was? When I read that message, why would she care? because that's the mindset I had with this whole thing from the gate. And that's what made me come. It was because there's someone that actually cared. You're the first and you're the only survivor. You know, which is a miracle. You know, I, and this makes me feel really good because there is a reason why I'm here. And I guess I am not that ugly, you know. I, and I'm not worthless. Marlon, we don't normally, we do not name rape victims. That's just a policy. I just want to have a discussion with you just about including your... My name? Yeah, Marlene Gabrielson. Yeah. Story. Marlene K. Gabrielson. I'm a newbie. I'm a strong woman. <laughs>